Hi guys, welcome. This is the mini e-lecture to support the workshop on ice core analysis that you're going to be doing. Um, in terms of the chemistry contribution to XD3103, the planet Earth, this is, or the workshop will be the last activity. This is just to support that workshop. I also should take the opportunity to thank Dr. Bolton from the Earth Observatory of Singapore at NTU. Um, she will be here uh, to support us as we do this exercise and um, we're very grateful for her presence. Okay, so the structure of this little mini e lecture, which probably will be 15 minutes, maybe not too much more, I hope, is here. Um, references throughout this course I have tended to recommend Broker's little book Wallace Broker's book How to Build a Habitable Planet and the last chapter of this book is actually again quite useful good context for this workshop there are specific references in the workshop um, and again I commend these to you um, if you find yourself interested in this, the further reading in the workshop you will also find helpful. The materials for this workshop, obviously you're listening to this, so you know that this little e-lecture thing is on the multimedia stream. Uh, the uh, script for the workshop, the Excel file for the workshop, and the PowerPoint version of uh, this uh, little e lecture is on the chemistry lecture part of the work bin. Okay, so let's get to it. Changing Earth. You don't really need me to tell you that we live on a, a changing planet. In the previous lectures, we've seen just how drastic those some of those changes have been. Um, from the formation of the planet. Now, for the last one, two million years, we've largely lived in a pretty much oscillating environment where we have these two states of glacial and interglacial, um, or at least until maybe 500 years ago that, that was the case. 500 years ago, human beings began to make a significant impact on the planet and who knows? Maybe we are not so much in an oscillating environment at the moment. Maybe we're in a more modified environment. Hopefully, as you do this workshop, you might be able to answer some of those questions. So let's think about this changing planet that we live on. Um, this is a part of the uh, geological time scale. So across the bottom, we have millions of years ago. So now the present zero is on the right. And as you go left, you go back through the geological periods. I won't bother to define them. You can do so yourself if you want to. I'm going to have a quick tea. Now, what this graph is, is two... Um, bits of information on this graph. The first is a smooth long-term average of effectively a temperature measure. Um, it's uh, oxygen isotope 16-18 ratio um, and effectively the higher this ratio is then the warmer the environment. The lower this ratio is, along here, the colder the environment. Um, the, there's a shorter term average rolling on there and the grey is uncertainty in the measurements. So, gla this glacial, interglacial um, type of period that we're in at the moment hasn't been existing through most of Earth history. Just specific periods of time we've had these type of interludes. 
Um, this is the fourth, if you will, glacial interlude. Um, whether Snowball Earth occurred or not, which is right back here, not too sure. So I've not really counted that. Okay. So moving back effectively to the last lecture. Uh, you recall we looked at the different reasons, potential reasons for changing climate on the planet. And we came up with extraterrestrial reasons. And we came up with, if you like, local reasons. And this workshop actually involves both of those types of reason. The thing we first came upon in the last lecture was the orbital variations or characteristics of our, um, our planet's orbit around the Sun, uh, so-called Milankovitch um, cycles, and how these affected the amount and the distribution of solar insulation or solar energy that reaches the planet. And effectively, that caused global systematic changes, for instance, ice ages. And you may remember that the, the three modes, precession, obliquity and eccentricity, um, these little sketches hopefully remind you of uh, what each of those three modes are, <coughs> and how those modes could be modelled. So for precession, this is the effect of that particular um, orbital um, characteristic. That will, This will be the effect, the red line, on the solar insulation reaching the Earth. Obliquity, the green, is again, this green line is the effect just of obliquity um, on the amount of solar insulation that reaches the Earth. And finally, eccentricity, the fact that we have an elliptical orbit. Again, the blue line is the effect on solar insulation um, of that particular characteristic of our orbit. Now, this, what, what one can get software um, to actually add and subtract functions like this. If you were to add all those three functions up, um, then you get this yellow line. So, if we look at the time scale, it's the opposite to the one we had last time. Now, zero if you like, is here on the top left. And as we go back in time, we can see what the cumulative effect in the yellow line is of those orbital characteristics, so-called solar forcing. This is at 65 north in summer, but the, um, that's irrelevant for our discussion at the moment. Right at the bottom here are the stages of glaciation that we've experienced over that same 1,000 kilo year period. So that's a million years, a thousand times a thousand. And um, with this particular bottom graph here, uh, basically hot is at the top and cold is at the bottom. So when it's down here, we're having a glaciation. Now, this is a lot of data and to make it easier for us to see really and more um, connected to our exercise, we're going to concentrate on just the most recent 250,000 years in the blue box that you see on the screen now. So I'm going to move to the next slide where in fact what you will see is just the 250,000, last 250,000 years of the orange line and also you'll see some temperature data on that same scale. Okay, so here we are now and we're focusing just on the last 250,000 years. 
and on this graph zero that's now is at the right hand side and we go back 250,000 years to there now this top curve the yellow curve that's the effectively the same yellow curve that you had in the last slide the cumulative contribution of Milankovitch effects the different orbital characteristics uh, that our planet has and this is the change in solar insulation to different parts of the globe of those orbital changes so that's fine now let's think about the bottom graph now certainly yes it's actually temperature anomaly from uh, average temperature um, and first just looking at it um, per se cold is low so in fact when it's at the bottom here we are clearly in glacial type periods so we have for instance there and there and we could carry on there and there and when we're here when temperature is high we're in interglacial periods so that's all plumb and dandy but this also contains something else apart from the extraterrestrial Milankovitch type effects this also contains if you like the homegrown climate effects remember that the um, the homegrown effects things like atmospheric absorption albedo those effects those things on our planet not extraterrestrial that affect uh, climate and affect temperature are bundled up in here with the Milankovitch effects as well okay so simply to you've seen this slide before to reaffirm that what those uh, atmospheric effects are from our, for our purposes this is from the IPCC uh, the report is in the 2007 and in 2014 physical bases and you remember the greenhouse effect we have incoming radiation from the Sun um, nice yellow maximum in the visible though you've got lots of other wavelengths there as well harder wavelengths and that energy is absorbed by the planet some of it is reflected before it gets to the ground and is reflected off things like clouds and aerosols some of it is actually reflected by the surface so if you're in the Antarctic for instance or in ice or snow covered areas some of that is reflected and that 30 of 342 is a global average number so it it comprehends that the sea and the land all have different albedos and it's been modeled that's not where we are worried about for the greenhouse effect you'll remember that whereas the Sun um, is a black body radiator at about six and a half thousand K Kelvin um, and therefore uh, by black body theory uh, it emits in the visible um, the earth is a black body radiator with a surface temperature of about 300 Kelvin and so that emits in the infrared area and to maintain temperature stability the incoming radiation must equal the outgoing radiation providing you add it all up properly so that outgoing radiation from the surface in the infrared um, heads up um, skywards as it were some of it will escape and be radiated directly into space some of it will be absorbed by so-called greenhouse gases um, quite a lot of it gets absorbed by greenhouse gases things like carbon dioxide water methane and so on and so forth so that second this lower graph here contains not only 
the Milankovitch changes in solar insulation, it also can change, contains those absorptions here. Um, the lessening of uh, the amount of radiation that would be normally emitted and this is entirely natural or at least it was up until about 500 years ago. If this didn't happen then we would be a very much colder planet than we now are. The greenhouse effect is effectively like a blanket. Okay, so if we move on and again you almost certainly have seen this, I've just taken this straight off Wikipedia. Um, this is the growing carbon dioxide concentration and current concentrations um, in the uh, troposphere are in April there were 399 parts per million by volume so pretty much we're at 400 parts per million by volume now which is um, certainly a nice comfortable number to remember and last year just gone was the largest annual increase in carbon dioxide that we've ever seen whilst we've uh, been able to uh, monitor obviously and um, so the slope of this line is actually increasing but we talked about that in terms of the potential abrupt climate change so we need to think just uh, a little bit now because if we are studying climate and climate changes naturally there are long-term natural changes um, and again we just need to go back here to see those long-term natural changes there weren't major cities around 30,000, 60,000, 210,000 years ago um, this is natural variation. Um, so if we want to study climate we have to have those long-term databases. In the lecture I believe we looked at uh, the last hundred and odd years at uh, rainfall uh, events in the UK but clearly that's not much use when we're looking at a system that's varying on this sort of time scale. Now we don't really have um, decent measurements, instrumental measurements, the best is 500 up until 500 years ago. Um, from 500 years we begin to get some decent measurements um, but largely that's a tiny speck of nothingness on this graph, it's right at the end here. So effectively very little in the way of instrumental measurements. So we look for proxy data. We look for data which, from which we can get the measurements that there weren't people around to take. Um, now that's why or how we get to ice cores because it turns out that ice cores are wonderful data banks of exactly the sort of climate data that we don't have. And again largely um, you're probably aware of this so snow falls in cold undisturbed areas and as the snow mounts up you get pressure from above and that snow uh, the crystal form changes and you get ice um, under the right conditions that ice uh, you have annual bands in it as sort of temperature changes and effectively you have a record of um, the isotopes of water because ice is mostly water the elements are hydrogen and oxygen and both hydrogen and oxygen have isotopes that can be used to actually regenerate the temperature at that time. There is dust in that ice which might have come from volcanic eruptions, it might have come from wind fields so that if you've got lots of wind fields you're going to have lots of dust blowing around potentially so that gives you another type of climate information. You have trapped atmospheric bubbles. Um, I won't talk about the mechanisms of how that happens but you get the snow falling and 
after a while as the weight pushes it down at some point some of those pores seal and at that point then that bubble of atmosphere is isolated from the rest of the atmosphere and so you can use those bubbles to give you um, the composition of certain key gases in the atmosphere. We for instance use carbon dioxide and methane are two of the really important ones um, and uh, there are others. And finally the ice itself contains dissolved species and some of those beyond the scope of this workshop are very interesting indeed. So I currently have a project running looking at uh, the atmospheric, the, the oxidizing capacity of the atmosphere. Now for that part of the crocodile mechanism we talked about in the lectures produces um, organic acids, carbonic, uh, not carbonic acids, sorry, carboxy acids. And my thesis, my theory is that as the oxidizing capacity of the atmosphere changes, there's a lot of debate about how that is or isn't changing and how it did or didn't change, that the distribution of those um, carbos carboxylic acids will also change. And of course these are soluble species, dissolved species. So we can look in the ice core record for those carboxylic acids and there we may have, I don't know at the moment, we may have a record in those ice cores of atmospheric um, oxidative capacity. Anyway, the world stock of ice cores is growing all the time. There's about 50 now, or more than 50. And in some of them, the ice is up to 800,000 years old. Now, it doesn't automatically follow that if the ice is 800,000 years old, you can extract this proxy data for 800,000 years ago simply because the older the ice is the more scrunched up it gets that's a technical term <laughs> um, the more difficult it is to extract data we've currently got proxy data for about um, back to 200,000 years before present so that's a, a reasonable uh, lump of data now in this workshop we are going to use the data from our some of the data from one of those ice cores, the so-called Vostok core. It's drilled in Antarctica, eastern Antarctica, and it's at the uh, Soviet research station Vostok. Surprise, surprise. Uh, Vostok, station Vostok, is at an altitude of 3488 meters above mean sea level, and the core, the length of this drill core of ice um, is somewhere this says 2,080 meters there's a second core which takes it to 2,360 meters if memory serves um, it's obviously growing all the time um, the difficulty of course is whether our technical expertise grows enough that we are able to extract climate data from it um, this is uh, actually not from the Vostok core, this is from one of the Greenland cores. Um, and this is simply a, a backlit sample of this ice which has been cut into thin wafers, which is how we use it. Um, and you can see under appropriate lighting, you can see these bands. These are annual bands, so if for instance you've got an air bubble, like you have there or there, you can literally count back the years and establish what year that piece of trapped um, air is from. Now in fact it's not quite as straightforward. For most of the things we've talked about that's exactly how you do it. But for air bubbles they take a while to close so they are always, the air bubbles always reflect an atmosphere later than the ice which they're in. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so these ice samples 
each year have been analyzed with respect to isotopic content, particularly uh, hydrogen with a proton and a neutron called deuterium, H2, and that too should be superscripted. The, they've been analyzed with respect to the dust, the methane, uh, methane and carbon dioxide in the uh, air bubbles, and so forth. Okay, so we actually get to the workshop and at this point because you haven't attended the workshop yet um, all the material you need is an IVLE please bring your laptops uh, you can't do this workshop unless you've got a laptop with you so bring your laptop um, in the chemistry lectures work bin on IVLE you should be able to find the PowerPoint of this mini lecture so this PowerPoint without me ranting over it, the Excel file Vostok.xls which you need and the workshop instructions which you need to print out. Um, one should uh, recognize this exercise has been adopted from parts of the um, Environmental Systems Climate course at Columbia University and also some of the University of Michigan's um, lab courses on ice core data. We'll start the exercise at the workshop. So we'll all roll up, get our laptops out and start there. But just to, I suppose, give you a feel for this, I'll take you through just the first task so you can see how it works. So you're going to open the Excel file and you've got your instructions. And um, what we'll do now is we'll go and look at those instructions. Um, the instructions say plot both the ice age and the gas age as a function of depth on the same graph. Now this refers to what I was just talking about about the gas bubbles. So the ice will be older or you expect, sorry let's start that again, um, Yes, the ice will be older than the gas bubbles that are in that ice because of this mechanism of the bubble closing. The bubble doesn't close when the snow falls. The ice, the snow has to be compressed into ice and in that process um, at some point those air gaps close and so that the air sample in the bubble is somewhat younger than the ice in which it is. So the ice age refers to the age of the ice and the gas age refers to the age of the when the bubble was closed basically. There are some questions here which I'll sure, I'm sure I'll leave you to think about yourself um, but what it tells you to do is to plot both of these gas age and ice age as a function of depth on the same graph. So I've done that and this is what the plot looks like. I just happen to like this format of the plot. I mean it's up to you how you plot it. And indeed you can see that the ice age appears to be um, older than the gas age which is exactly as we would expect and I won't go any further through the workshop now, but that's what we'll do when we see each other um, for the workshop. Okay, so uh, we'll move through the rest of this at the workshop. Um, so I will say goodbye and see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.